America's trees and forests are important to all of us. They are indispensable to our mental and physical well-being, providing sanctuary from stress and performing a number of functions that affect the quality of our environment. Trees absorb carbon dioxide and other gases, in turn replenishing the atmosphere with life-sustaining oxygen. They also filter out types of pollutants, provide habitat for birds and animals, conserve water, and reduce soil erosion. In short, trees enrich our lives in many different ways, so it's only natural that we should be concerned about the health of our woodlands and the trees that collectively make up our urban and community forests. Protecting our trees means enhancing conditions for their growth and sometimes helping them overcome potentially damaging pests. Among the most dramatic pests of the hardwood trees in the eastern United States is the gypsy moth, brought to this country by a French naturalist in 1869 to breed with silkworms. The moth escaped and proved very capable of surviving the North American climate. Today, the gypsy moth is firmly established over the northeastern part of the U.S. and is moving further to the south and midwest every year. Each summer sees new areas defoliated and more people getting acquainted with the gypsy moth and its associated problems. It has become increasingly important that landowners understand the moth's life cycle, its effect on the environment, and when necessary, how to manage it. Gypsy moth has one generation per year, and like other insects that go through complete metamorphosis, has four distinct life stages. The egg, the caterpillar, the pupa, and the adult moth. Egg mass emergence is dependent on temperature and usually coincides with bud break of most hardwood species. The young caterpillars, if weather conditions are cold and rainy, may remain on the egg mass for several days. As the temperatures warm, though, they will begin to leave the egg mass and instinctively climb up the trees. As they climb these trees, they will form a silken thread. Once they reach the top of these trees, they will dangle from these silken threads and rely on the wind to carry them to an adequate food source. Although in many cases, wind dispersal is merely to the next tree, in some cases, especially during gusty wind conditions, it can be several miles. Young caterpillars will alternate feeding and resting habits 24 hours a day, but as they grow larger, they will feed only at night and crawl down the tree during daylight hours to seek shelter. Like many other defoliating insects, it's the caterpillar stage that causes the damage, and for the next eight weeks, the gypsy moth will continue to feed and grow. The gypsy moth caterpillar can be identified by five sets of blue dots followed by six sets of red dots going down its back. And when full grown in size, can be from one and a half to two and a half inches long. Once the caterpillar reaches full development, it will begin a period of rest, also called pupation. Pupation allows the gypsy moth to go from a caterpillar stage into an adult moth stage. This pupation period lasts approximately two weeks. A gypsy moth pupa can be identified by its hard brown shell. Once metamorphosis is complete, the adult moth will begin to emerge. The males, which are excellent flyers, can be identified by their feathery antenna and brown color. The female moth, which is nearly white, cannot fly. Heavy with eggs, she must crawl to a suitable site to begin the egg laying process. The female will release a chemical attractant luring the male moth to her site to mate. Once mating occurs, the fertilized eggs can be laid by the female. An egg mass can contain upwards to a thousand eggs per mass and can be identified by their tan or buff color. They are also velvety to the touch. The adult moths cause no damage. Their only purpose is to mate. Once this occurs and egg masses are laid, they die. Now the cycle is complete. Once the egg masses have been laid, they will remain intact over the winter until the temperatures warm and the cycle begins anew. Since the adult female gypsy moth cannot fly, the only natural method of spread is through wind dispersal. 
Gypsy moth travel longer distances in quite another fashion, as uninvited stowaways, unobtrusively attaching their egg masses to vehicles, outdoor household articles, and nursery and forest products being moved from infested areas. This long distance man-caused spread results in isolated infestations far removed from the generally infested area. Here are some examples. Early detection of these artificial gypsy moth introductions is the key to their successful treatment. The most sensitive detection tool available is a trap baited with the gypsy moth sex attractant, or pheromone. Pheromone traps are deployed nationwide outside the generally infested area by the state and federal agencies. These traps capture male moths looking for mates, and in the process, warn managers that a gypsy moth introduction has occurred. The pattern and number of moths trapped indicate to what extent the moths may be established in an area. Once detected, these spot infestations can be treated and eliminated. Obviously, outside of the generally infested area, the best way to deal with the gypsy moth is to prevent it from becoming established. To try to check its long-distance spread by taking care not to import egg masses into non-infested areas. In fact, all the states where the gypsy moth is firmly established require certification that your outdoor and household articles do not contain gypsy moths before crossing the state line. If you are moving anything from an infested area to a non-infested area, you need to check with your state agricultural agency for quarantine regulations and certification requirements. Within the generally infested area, however, the gypsy moth cannot be avoided or eliminated, but it can be managed to reduce the problems that accompany dense populations. The forest environment represents a shifting mosaic of individual species and individual trees. The gypsy moth represents a new component, a new biological agent and stress factor in forest stands. Gypsy moth causes defoliation much like the native species of caterpillars cause defoliation in times past. The new factor is that gypsy moth is a much more pronounced defoliator. The first visible sign of gypsy moth defoliation is the presence of shot holes in, in the foliage. As the caterpillars grow, they begin to consume more and more of the foliage, and, and the canopy develops a rather tattered appearance. When populations are dense enough, the entire canopy is, is removed by the feeding caterpillars. In dense populations of gypsy moths, when uh, hardwoods are defoliated, they can produce a new set of leaves later on in the season. However, producing this new set of leaves uses up a lot of the starch reserves that are stored in their roots, that they would normally use for growth and just to maintain themselves. This is just one of the many stresses that uh, affect trees growing out in forest stands. Other stresses include weather, drought conditions, other insects, uh, pre-existing disease conditions. Uh, so defoliation is just one of the many stresses that affect trees and deplete their starch reserves. However, if defoliation occurs several years in a row, especially in combination with other stress factors, it can result in limb dieback and tree mortality. When tree mortality does occur, this creates small openings in the forest. Eventually, these openings will be filled with new trees. But in the meantime, these areas receive a lot of extra sunlight, which increases the vegetative growth. This, in turn, is beneficial for some wildlife species. Management of gypsy moth populations in recreation areas and residential settings is particularly important because trees in these developed sites are highly valued for their beauty and shade. With the added stress caused by soil compaction and root or stem injuries, these trees are more vulnerable to damage following gypsy moth defoliation. In addition to the loss of shade, the adverse effects of the gypsy moth on these sites include the nuisance caused by caterpillars and their droppings, possible allergic reactions to the caterpillar's hairs, and the potential hazards associated with dead limbs and trees. The gypsy moth feeds on more than 500 plant species, but it clearly favors all types of oak trees, as well as willow, aspen, gray, and river birch. Within the generally infested area, Gypsy moth population levels are monitored by state and federal agencies, 
and research indicates that sparse populations in newly infested areas can be monitored using large capacity pheromone traps. Dense populations in areas where the moth is firmly established are tracked by defoliation that results from their feeding. Aerial photography, sketch mapping, and satellite imagery are used to generate maps showing the location and extent of defoliation due to the gypsy moth. Using information from these trapping and aerial detection surveys, egg mass surveys are conducted in selected areas where the effects of the gypsy moth may conflict with the landowner's management objectives. Predictions can then be made about the extent of defoliation likely to occur in the coming year. This monitoring does more than merely provide a kind of gypsy moth census. It provides the basis upon which informed decisions can be made about which management techniques, if any, are appropriate. The first step in dealing with the gypsy moth is for the landowner to set management objectives. What are your priorities and goals? What do you want from your trees? And what are the costs in both economic and environmental terms? This first and in some ways most important step will help determine the appropriate course of action. The two broad categories of response to the gypsy moth are action and no action. Let's take a look at the no action option first. Uh, no action alternative to uh, gypsy moth infestation is to choose a different set of goals for the forest. And that really is the first thing that uh, one must do when deciding when uh, to intervene in a gypsy moth infestation is to set goals for forest management. Are we looking for wildlife outcomes? Are we looking for uh, tree production of, of wood and fiber? Are we looking for recreational opportunities or aesthetics? Or do we simply want to have a normally balanced, diverse forest uh, environment? Uh, if that is the case, sometimes spraying the forest is the absolute worst thing that we can do to bring about that uh, desired end. When we choose to let the natural process run its course, we are choosing to truly let the, the biological recovery processes take over. We're choosing to let the uh, community change in its plant composition. And indeed, we are choosing to accept a certain amount of species uh, alteration in the forest stand. One of the things that people are most shocked to see is when the defoliation occurs, all the leaves are gone from certain trees, and it appears that these trees are dead. Uh, this changes the atmosphere and the ambiance of the forest, and yet one of the things that's hard for us to keep in mind is that the forest will recover. When intervention is chosen as the, the best alternative, the federal state cooperative professionals that are on the job in most communities are really the best people to turn to for help. If you, as a landowner, set the minimum invasive goal that you are willing to accept, they can help you achieve that goal in the best and safest way. But in some cases, the no-action response does not meet the objectives expressed by landowners. This is most often the case where individual trees are important, such as in urban, recreational, or historical settings. In these cases, positive action can be used to deal with the moth. If you have high-density gypsy moth populations which have a potential for causing defoliation and you decide you want to do a treatment to reduce those populations, the two insecticides which are usually used are Stimulin, the insect growth regulator, and DT, the bacterial insecticide. There are other insecticides registered for gypsy moths, but only Dimelin and DT are part of the Forest Service Cooperative Suppression Program. The insect growth regulator Dimelin has been registered since 1976 by the Environmental Protection Agency for use on gypsy moth. It's an insect growth regulator, and it affects gypsy moth larvae, both small larvae and large larvae. It kills the larvae by preventing them from molting or going into the larger stage. Diflubenzeron, commonly known as demolin, has some distinct advantages and disadvantages. Among its advantages are its low cost its ability to deal with late-stage gypsy moth larvae, and the fact that it's not affected by sunlight. On the minus side, diflubenzeron affects other insects, specifically immature insects, and persists on the foliage for about 16 weeks. The bacterial insecticide Bt is a naturally occurring bacteria which is found in the soil. So once you apply the bacteria to the foliage, gypsy moth larvae feed on the foliage and then die from the bacteria. Bacillus thuringiensis affects only caterpillars, is readily available, and persists on the trees for about two weeks. However, it is easily washed off by rain and must be applied early in the caterpillar's life stages to be effective. 
Another insecticide which will be available in the future is Gypcheck. The Gypsum Law virus product. The problem that we have with Gypcheck is it's not in sufficient quantity to spray very many acres per year. Gypcheck is a promising viral-based insecticide which affects only the gypsy moth and no other insects. However, it is difficult to produce in large quantities, is easily washed off, and deteriorates quickly when exposed to sunlight. And like Bt, it must be used against early stages of the moth larvae. All of the insecticides we have discussed do not adversely impact fish, animals, birds, or humans. The cooperative program is developing and integrating low-level tactics specific for gypsy moth in with tactics that are typically used for managing high-density populations. Some of the low-level tactics being developed but not yet operational are mating disruption, which is the use of pheromone impregnated flakes to interfere with mating success, inherited sterility, which is the use of sterile gypsy moth life stages, mass trapping, which reduces the number of male moths and the release of natural enemies. If you decide to apply an insecticide, you want to make sure you apply the insecticide according to the label. And it's also a good idea to check with a county extension person or somebody with the state or federal government that's associated with gypsy moth programs. They've used these insecticides and will have valuable information which you'll be able to use. Dealing with the gypsy moth may seem a bit overwhelming to the average homeowner or landowner, but there are ways that everyone can help manage the problem. Your local agricultural, forestry, or extension service agencies are a good source of additional advice on how to reach your management needs. Through the use of an integrated approach that combines landowner management objectives with gypsy moth population monitoring, we are better able to plan, assess, and implement strategies for managing the gypsy moth. We have better tools, more sensitive to the environment than ever before and continuing research shows great promise. Looking to the future, programs such as The Gypsy Moth in the Classroom are helping tomorrow's decision makers understand the effects that the gypsy moth and its management might have on our resources in the years to come. But today, your involvement is vital in the decision-making process that will affect our future. Together, we can choose the best alternatives for managing the gypsy moth.